Alright, they invited me out and uh, I gotta use this time the best I possibly can to learn something about corals and I thought maybe it makes sense to find out the thing that you like the most and learn about that one, which is? It's Ganiopora. So um, I get asked a lot, like, what's my favorite coral? And usually I don't have an answer for that at all. Like it changes over time. At, at some point, at some points in my in my hobby adventure, it's been like elegance corals. Sometimes it's blastomusa. But if I had to pick anything like right this second, it's Ganiopora. Okay, but why? Right. I mean, there's something that's inspiring you right now about it. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, I tend to like large polyp stony corals. I like their aesthetic. Uh, I, I've never been a huge SPS junkie or anything like that. It's always been large polyp stonies, but I, I like the um, the movement of them. Kind of like how um, you get that with hammers, torches, and frog spawn, but with Ganiopora, it just has a completely different color palette than those corals, mm -hmm. and there is just something pleasing about that that flower shape like i just liked it i just like it so much and i think that in in a weird like masochistic way i like the fact that they're a little challenging mm -hmm. i mean because that's what hobby is reefing and hobby is really all about and you, you and until lately you really never saw like a a ganiopora dominated system You've never heard anybody say, oh, man, these Ganiopora are just taking over my tank. It's a weed. Like, you just, <laughs> these things just don't happen. So there is, like, an inherent challenge in there. And, yeah, just, just the aesthetics just works for me. So I got to say I agree. I like, you know, uh, what my buddy Elliot would call them is flowy stonies. You know, uh, like, things that move, man, bring, like, life to the tank. You know, I like them, too. Mm-hmm. I change all the time and what I like, you know, based on whatever I'm inspired by over the moment. But like, you know, typically that would have been, historically anyway, that would have been your frog spawns, your torches, your hammers and whatever. But mm -hmm. these give that same thing. And like, I guess I wouldn't have put it the way that you just said it, but it, the flowery look of them, right? Yeah. And there's so many other colors that like, there's only so many variants of torch you can get and then it starts to get pretty subtle. Mm -hmm. The differences between the Ganipora are stark. Yeah, and there's so many different kinds that I think that like right right at this moment, anyways, like the industry is kind of like scrambling to name all the different little tiny variants in its list. I mean, sometimes the names have uh, a useful function, but I mean, right now it's like the wild west because there's so many different color variations. I feel like this has the potential to end up like zoanthids. You know, it could like, be that many. There's, there's a time. I mean, zoanthids is crazy diverse, but yeah, it's every single time I, I look at uh, at the different offerings of Ganiopora, just you know, nationwide, it's like there's not a lot of overlap. I mean, there's just unique specimens abound. Yeah. Uh, so I don't blame you for that being your core, uh, core, our favorite coral, and why? Because I think it might be right on the top of my list as well. But the reason, like, where this probably wasn't on my list 10 years ago or maybe longer than that, but it was kind of considered a doomed coral. Yeah. I mean, er, early on, right, uh, there was an, a push in the hobby to ban their import. Oh, really? Like, it, it was that know. bad hmm. because this was a coral that was like simply known to be one of these corals that dies in like three to six months. Hmm. It just does not survive. And... um it was kind of just like people people tried to try all kinds of different things and nothing really just seems to work they they might be like you know what my 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 gani is still alive uh, wait a month it's dead hmm. and uh i think that the disconnect at the time was that there's actually a lot of different species of ganiopora i mean as much as i would like to say that it's all because like we got better as hobbyists but you know as much as things change in the hobby, a lot of stuff stays really the same. And the one big thing with Ganiopora, though, the thing that changed the most is that we just have different specimens altogether. Like those ones that were probably uh, dying left and right might still be dying left and right, but they're just not being imported anymore because mm -hmm. there's like not a lot of demand for them. They're, they tend to be like greenish, brownish, nobody cares. Now everything's a rainbow. And it turns out that the ones that are rainbows different species entirely, way more robust and hardy. 
I mean, how lucky is that? And infrequent is the most visually stunning also happens to be uh, the easiest to maintain. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to it being the opposite where like yeah. that, that dirt brown thing grows like a plague. Uh, like sponges, right? The decorative sponges. Mm -hmm. uh, the really pretty ones next to impossible. The invasive gray ones that are going to kill all your corals. You can't kill those. Like you can't even freshwater bath them. They don't care. So, so yeah. What you're saying is part of the new found success for these things is we're just simply getting different species from different locations. Different animal just entirely. Them. Yeah. In Inside of there, this isn't something I think you could put like your thumb on and say for sure this is it. Like you already kind of hinted at this, but like dude, we are just better at this than we were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so like people are just maintaining their water better. They're feeding the corals better. They're learning like the things that for other corals work that probably also work here, you know? And so it's hard to, you can't like say that one of these things, but the more stable the system is, the more animals are going to live. That's probably the, the, the key there. Cause I think that, um, the the primary concepts haven't changed in all this time. So it's like, how do you have a good good reef tank? It's like good water quality, good light, good flow. That really hasn't changed in 20 years. But the tools that you have at your disposal to um, to curate the, that environment is a lot more refined now. And I think that there's a lot more attention being paid to very specific things, whereas in the past, not so much. Mm -hmm. So I guess in that sense, um, we do keep good water, good light, good flow better. But back then, even if you did have all three, that coral died. Sure. So let me think about this way. Like, I agree with you. A lot of the fundamentals haven't changed. The way that we achieve those fundamentals has changed. The gear has changed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's easier or better and whatnot. But... Like if I had to think about this as a whole, I'm going to make these numbers up because there isn't a real one, but as a whole, you know, 10 years ago, what percent of the popular reefing population was actually doing those things exceptionally well? Like less than 1%. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say pretty low. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we knew the fundamentals, but how many people were actually doing it? Yeah, very few. Yeah. Okay, so now I can't venture as to say how many people are doing the fundamentals well today, but I got to believe it's like Better. 10, maybe, uh, maybe 100 times more. Even if it was only 1.1% before, I mean, easily, I, I think it depends on the scale that you're approaching this, but like there's just so many more two and three year reefers that have really figured it out than there were 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how big of a role that plays in the success of Ganyapura because you make some good points, but in general, I think that flows into a lot of other corals that were used to be problems that aren't, is we're just better at it. Mm. It's hard to say which part of it is better definitively, but we're maintaining a better atmosphere. Yeah, and I guess like to to that point, um, it's easier to find information about these things, mm -hmm. and it's easier to find people that have had what at least what appears to be success. Uh, like back in the day, like your your main references uh, were pretty inaccessible. It would be either uh, a publication once a year in in a magazine. It would be maybe a speaker at Macna. It's probably going to be your local f uh, fish store, and your chances of even talking to other hobbyists pretty slim. Like, it just wasn't a lot of media around this. All right, I'm going to take the information you just shared. I'm going to go ahead and try to, like, make a best practice. Like, you want to be successful with this. Okay. Best practice, you want to be successful with this? Get a species or type of Ganyapura that other people are successful with because it's probably more about the sourcing than what you're doing. So. Yeah, so if if um, if there is a longstanding um, record for this thing being propagated in captivity – Get one that's propagated in captivity. Okay. Start with that. All right. So that actually goes to, was it farmed or wild collected? Because the one that was farmed clearly can grow in a, in a captive environment and mm -hmm. <laughs> so well that it can be reproduced and sold. Yes. Uh, well, the one out of the wild, question mark. There's some cool ones coming in from overseas, but you, you, um, it is an extra layer of risk for sure. Yeah, I think you have to be willing to, more willing to throw a little bit of money away. 
to find the one. Yeah, yeah. and and there, there are there are really curious things that can show up on a wild colony. And mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing, like people have like their favorite list of of uh, you know pests that they lament over. I promise you the weird weird stuff they have no names. Oh yeah. And uh and they are uniquely uh capable of eating Ganiopora. We had a, a SPS tank at the office, uh, Jason's tank, and it was just a 60 cube, but it was one of the most colorful SPS tanks in the building, right? And some little microscopic black bug was the cause that wiped the whole thing out. And really? all of the searching we could do, we couldn't really find you know, what it was, but it was definitely the thing that wiped this whole thing out. You know, And if you look on a microscope, there's tons of them. Mm. You know? uh, but how would you even, I mean, how many people actually even microscope their coral? You not know. too often and you, yeah. and you have to know what, what it is that you're looking for and um yeah even in a show tank it's difficult in a, in a facility we just have to assume that every now and again we have to like do an, an entire system treatment whether stuff looks shady or not yeah it's I just it's, it's it's time okay anyway <laughs> so uh different morphology meaning like a different visual look yeah so i mean how many are there what does it look like Okay, so this is uh, this isn't like uh, the varieties that are out there, but you know, like how susceptible is a coral to change mm. in and of itself? So, like on, on one end, you have like Acropora, which you do anything to it, it's going to change color, mm -hmm. good or bad, it's going to change. You ship it, it's going to change. You move it from place to place, it's going to change. Change it from tank to tank, it's going to change. Um, I see that by the way all the time, where we take a, a coral and we move it, you know, like six inches to the left mm -hmm. and it just changes color because the you know biology there is just different the flow is different the light could be you know just 75 par different but it was enough to cause it to change yeah so for ganiopora it's a little of both so their normal coloration when everything is going really well is remarkably consistent so we have like something called a glitter bomb gani it's a very distinct look there is another very, very popular one in the industry called an amaze ball. It's like like orange, yellow, reds. Very consistent look for what that's supposed to be. However, if you do anything to stress these things out, they can change so dramatically. And those are not ideal colors. Because it, it's it's kind of clear that there has been a stress response in some way, shape, or form. But it will look completely unrecognizable for over a year. And not good, you're saying. So it's not like changing into something else desirable. I think they look amazing, regardless. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like our, our amaze, uh, I'm sorry, our the, the, the green glitter bomb Ghani is uh it's like it's speckled. The, the the green isn't like a crazy neon thing, right? So it it's kind of like, you know. A middle tone green, kind of like this backdrop sort of thing, but mm -hmm. it's speckled and it's like it's it's very pretty. The one that I have that's a stress responded one though is hyper hyper radioactive kryptonite green. Interesting. And the polyps are smaller. Mm -hmm. the, the the stalks don't extend quite as much. The overall colony just looks a little tighter, but it's been this way for like a year, so it's not like dying dying. We've dipped it many many times. Uh, probably doesn't help the stress response at all. But yeah, you would never say, oh, that is the same thing as the rest of the stuff that you're farming. It's just kind of by itself. And it is the most glowing green thing in the tank. Hmm. Um, similarly with that amaze balls, again, classic look. In a different system though, it is, um, again, smaller, but it has a completely different yellow glow from inside and much less of the red. Again, genetically identical to the other stuff. And the systems that we're talking about, they are in different systems. However, the systems are designed to be identical. So it's not a matter of, oh, well, this one is designed for SPS, while well, this one's designed for mushrooms. No, we're, we're going for the same parameters in both, yet you're seeing like that, that level of color change. And ideally, I think you wouldn't see that, but it is an indicator. And then once I think it, it gets more tracking with like the baseline look of it, that's when you've kind of succeeded hmm. getting over whatever the heck. Interesting. All right. So now we're going to run into some problems. 
like you're just like this coral like you said is uh uh not what we describe as expert only anymore but not impossible yep but also not the easiest thing so what kind of things can you do to proactively you know fend off those problems or react to them even yeah i think proactive is the key because uh there, there's kind of like an adage in the industry or in the, in the hobby where it's like you know, just leave your hands out of the tank like your, your tank is probably better like less of you is a good thing mm -hmm. right um, and this is like a lesson I learned in coral farming. It's the opposite. Like w the more you can touch stuff, the better, <laughs> because neglect is the bigger issue in, in a setting like this. And the lesson that I learned, especially with Ganiapora, is that, you know, sometimes like a Ganiapora will close up and it's like, that's normal. That's natural. They, they close up, they react to stuff. What they don't do is they, they don't stay closed unless there's actually something wrong. So if there's like weeks that are going by where this co this coral is not extending, uh, something is the problem. And here's where like, I have to say this with all the nuance in the world, okay? If you look at a coral under a microscope, you will see a world open up to you of microbial life. And a lot of this microbial life is just the biology of the coral itself. It is perfectly natural and healthy. But if we're talking about a coral that is closed and it's staying closed, what you're seeing under the microscope or whatever might be a pretty bad thing. And what we, um, what we decided to do was we tried to find the most gentle dip possible that is marginally effective because we don't really know exactly what we're trying to target. But we know that like something is going on and we want to be, again, a little bit extra precautious and extra cautious and be proactive. So we use a, a dip that's a calcium, um, I'm sorry, a potassium chloride based dip. It's, uh, it's made by Polyp Lab. It's called Reef Primer. Uh, basically, it is using a, a mix of potassium salts. And the potassium salts, very gentle on the corals. There's no perfect dip out there, but it does seem to really help these uh, these kind of like struggle bussing Ganiopora. So like when we start to see stuff that's like, okay, that's that's no good. Let's go ahead and just get that entire thing dipped. And oftentimes they do recover beautifully from that. Okay, so I personally have never used a potassium you know, chloride dip. Yeah. Like I'm prior to you talking about this, I mean, I get amazed every day that there's something new that I'd like never heard of. I, I mean, I've heard of the tea tree oils, mm -hmm. you know, all the different almond oils, the antibiotics, the hydrogen peroxide, you the know. really bad stuff that's in Bayer. Yeah. Or yeah, that weird one, you yeah. know, uh, I, like, I'm not even sure if that is how effective that is. <laughs> you know? Oh, you know? it does something. It does something. But like, you know, like there's so many things that, are dips out there? This one's new to me. Yeah. So, like, what makes potassium chloride? How's it work, and what what makes it different? So, uh, just just anecdotally here, it makes stuff look like it explodes from the inside out. Interesting. Yeah. So, so for example, like, it's particularly effective on flatworms. Uh, a lot of times, like with the with the with the tree oils and stuff like that, the, it does absolutely work and, and kill flatworms. But it's a slower process. In some cases, I had to wait a little while before it would actually take effect. This stuff is like, bang, it, it's working. So is it like a full strength thing or you're adding it to salt water? Or? You add it to salt water. It's actually, a, it's a salt. Okay. So it's a, it's like, a, I forget exactly what the quantity is. I mean, like a tablespoon or something per gallon. Mm -hmm. And you just mix it in, in, into a solution. And you toss the corals in there. And again, like the, the selling point for me as if I sell this stuff, right? Um, is that it is it is gentle on a wide variety of corals. There's very few corals that will have like a negative reaction to it. And cause like the you just don't want to kill the patient. You know, you're trying mm -hmm. to be you're trying to help. Operation was successful, you killed the patient, you know, that sort of thing, right? Operation was successful, but the patient died. Um, you want to avoid that that if at all possible. And I think that with a more gentle dip, that does get the job done. That's kind of like where I want to be. If I had like a, a very specific issue with like nudie bronx, I would use probably something else. But if it, if I'm trying to do like some general maintenance and I I'm, I see something like suspicious, this is this is the route I would rather go. Yeah, it's funny. 
I have gone the other direction. Uh, okay. Which is like the most aggressive thing known to man. Uh, in my case, being peroxide and a lot of stuff. That's pretty aggressive. Yeah. Uh, but like a lot of the corals I use it on don't seem to have an issue with it more than a day. You know, mm -hmm. they look fine the next day and probably better, actually. They all, especially in LPS, all that weird algaes and stuff that grow in their skeleton, those things it are kills gone. the heck out of algae. Yep, those are wiped out. We're not introducing any more funky stuff there. Uh, and, like, I, like, I've looked at it under the microscope, too. I mean, you just watch all the pests just explode as the peroxide just eats them alive, like, right there. It, have you ever yeah. done peroxide with Ghanis? I have... Not okay. Yeah, yeah. I was curious. I just I, I haven't either. So we just did it on, like, don't do this. But uh, we did it on almost every coral that came out of the 750 that went into my tank. Uh, it's all SPS corals. Oh. and so it was like a diluted strength of it, and we switched it in there for about you know 30 seconds each, right? Uh, and some of them absolutely browned out, man. There's no question. It's very yeah. harsh. Yeah, but like, uh, I gotta tell you, this is we did it because there was pests in that tank, right? Uh, I wanted to get rid of the aptasia that was in that tank. Uh, I wanted to get rid of uh, uh, that. I didn't want to introduce any more, rather. Uh, I also it has acrid and flatworms on it. I don't mm. know whether or not this uh, solved that problem or not, you know. But like, uh, I gotta tell you. I found the eggs in the water. So it absolutely was at least removing some, you know, hmm. the adults for sure. I mean, the adults just explode. So I have gone a little, kind of, I mean, <laughs> you know, the reality is I want to explore them all and I yeah. want to find the right answer. But yeah. it's interesting to add another new one in the mix when other things, when you want to be more gentle. Uh, and so the potassium, yeah. pop labs. There you go. Yeah. I quite like it. There you go. Uh, all right. So how fast can you expect Ganyapur to grow? Like you said earlier, no one has ever said, man, did Ganyapur just take over my tank? This yeah. isn't Xenia. It's like, yeah, it's like, damn, I, I need to like cut back this stupid amaze balls. It's too big. Very few people have that issue. Like very, very few people. So it's not a particularly fast growing coral, but I think when things are going well, the coral itself is bigger. So the skeleton might not be that much bigger, but the I guess like the the size of the tentacles, the size mm. of the stalks, everything else just scales up. It's almost like you just like took the picture and you dragged the corner and it's just a bigger animal. And again, like the fist-sized um, colony uh, could have like a basketball-sized footprint. Mm. Like it just it just swells up and just gets bigger. That's interesting. Yeah. Alternatively, it could retract down to the size of a fist. Wow. And so I've never grown one to basketball size before. So that is like a really interesting, you know, God, I mean, that's it's huge. Yeah. And so a lot of, a lot of frags that are sold, um, the, the, the actual size of the skeleton is very, very small, but you are still talking about like a two inch thing fully extended. Mm -hmm. And so like, and, and the shipping process, anytime you touch these things, you, it's going to go completely to skeleton. Mm -hmm. And then it, it takes a little while for it, to, for it to come back out. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, not super fast growing. Uh, it's not going to overgrow uh, your tanks too easily unless you're, you're working with nanos or something. But yeah, it, it's a very comfortable spot. I personally wish it would grow a little bit faster because it is a very in-demand in, in coral right now. But we just have to make that up with scale here. Just like, you know, I allocate more space to it to, to compensate. But yeah, it, it's a it's a very cool coral that uh, it'll never like get out of control. But it'll it's not like one of these corals that just never grows. There's certain ones that are just so super slow. So I actually have found that moderate growth corals are kind of like in my sweet spot of what I want because I don't really want to do the bonsai piece of this. I want to design it, make it look good, kind of know where it's going, you know, in the next year, have it mm -hmm. land there and then ideally just stay there. Right. Whereas there's lots of tanks that part of the skill set really requires all of a sudden now that you're like 
you know, in there cutting them all the time. This is one of the things that prevent me from getting into planted freshwater tanks. I love that look. I love that like crazy mountain aquascape look, the fake waterfall, mm -hmm. the fake forest, all of those things. But never in a million years would you see me in there every day clipping it, you know? Uh, no thanks. <laughs> yeah, I just no thanks. I don't have I don't have the time for that or the patience. But man, is it cool? So for me, you know, like if you could get something that grows moderately fast, but also, you know, looks reasonably good, you know, within a matter of days to months, or weeks to months, sweet, this right inside my pocket. Yeah, I think that there's there's something to be said for that because. Oftentimes, um, I think people are looking for a faster growing coral. And I understand that because a lot of people shop for frags and they want that to be bigger when they have it settled into their tank. But careful what you wish for because like your tank typically isn't that big. Even mm -hmm. like if you have like a big tank, it's really not that big if you're dealing with a fast growing coral. And, um, and corals are one of those things that if they grow to a certain size, you have to deal with it. It's almost like um, having to like file down like pigs' tusks and stuff. It's like it can be a problem and these things need to be uh, addressed. So like um, e even like Acropora colonies that grow too big, like the, their own size sabotages them or they grow into the next thing next to them and then they both die back 50%. Mm -hmm. You typically don't run into that with with Ganeopora because it doesn't tend to be hyper aggressive and uh, it, it stays at a manageable size for the vast majority of aquariums, which is nice. Hmm. Very cool. So in that spirit, feeding them, is there value to feeding them? What mm. would you feed them? Frequency, frequency, what? So tricky, so tricky. So they are not a coral that looks like they're grabbing and eating food. Mm -hmm. They have a completely different behavior as they react to food. So they'll do this thing where like the, the polyps are extended. And when you put literally any kind of food of your choice on them, they'll do this bobbing motion. Each, each mm -hmm. polyp will just bob like that. And it's like, and I've heard that is their feeding response. At the same time, I'm like watching the polyp and I'm like, I don't see food getting into that animal at all, right? Uh, and, and so we, we've done a lot of different feeding videos and it's kind of unclear to me. However, uh, again, talking about polyp lab, uh, they have a product called Reefroids. Mm -hmm. They started that, that product specifically to feed Ganeopora. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I Very think uh, fine. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a it's a powdered plankton food, and a lot of corals really like it. But again, it's like the the Ganeopora specifically have a really kind of cryptic behavior as to like whether or not they're actually eating. Until you get to like the bigger sizes of Ganeopora, like the really big fat polyps, and those I've actually seen grab and eat mice as shrimp. Oh, really? Okay, and I was like, well, that was unexpected. Hmm. You know, that sort of thing. So um, it, it may be hit or miss depending on the type of species, the type of foods that you're feeding. Right now, we don't go out of our way to do a lot of target feeding with, with Ganeopora. And that's specifically because food works. A lot of things like to eat food. And oftentimes, um, like the neighboring stuff that likes to eat starts to then mess with the ganis. So mm. if you have like a, if you have like a couple of vermitted snails, uh, if you want a thousand, try feeding your tank mm -hmm. because now you have created like the perfect environment for them to like sexually spawn in your in your in your yeah. aquarium. Filter feeders are all yeah, all your filter feeders. So some of them are kind of cool, some of them are less cool, but the the presence of food might circle back around and sabotage your efforts with ganis. So what do you think about? I mean, it's similar to this food conversation you just had, but like things like liquid foods, like uh, amino acids and stuff. I think it's all good. And when you're looking at it in a vacuum, feeding corals, good. Mm -hmm. But food is food. You feed a, a lot of other stuff. And uh, so you, you might have gone from a manageable situation that was chugging along just fine and in an effort to be better, you kind of skyrocket something that wasn't a problem to now it's a problem that you have to like 
pay, pay more attention pay to. Pay attention to what you're what you're also feeding. I guess. Is yeah, the and 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 the thing is, like, that's part of the hobby. Like, we are always trying to do stuff better, but in that effort, sometimes we create more problems. So you know, for me, amino acids have been a diff a journey, right? Because like early on, you know, the general theme of my club was that like snake oil you know mm. like this is totally unnecessary you can be successful with that and blah, blah blah and i i think i had that like you know kind of bias to begin with which is like kind of jaded like you really got to prove to me that this works for me to believe it you know uh and i have since realized that if that's the only standard is absolute proof i'm leaving all kinds of stuff on the table you know like i there's so many things we won't be able to prove to that level and so you know, experiencing my own and some of the investigates we've did worldwide, you know, stuff and, you know, people using these things like, okay, there's merit here. And uh, these corals definitely grow better, but also so does other stuff, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and now we sat in the experiment tanks too. You're going to grow, you know, other filter feeders and things in there. But like one of the things I learned probably in the last year or so is, like I didn't realize that many of these corals have like an active transport mechanism for amino acids, mm. meaning in their tissue they have like a charge, you know, that is attractive to amino acids they pull out of the water. Mm -hmm. The thing comes inside the tissue, it closes that thing up and opens it on the inside mm. to allow yeah. it in. So it's actively pulling it out. And then sometimes – seeing is believing like weird things like when i the first time i saw red seas like amino acid product like the ab or plus whatever it's mm -hmm. like neon green yeah like when a highlighter I, yeah when i was dosing like the the kz stuff it's like clear like i don't know it just like kind of feels like it's just dissipating in the water into nowhere like it doesn't uh -huh. i don't know man it's just like are you, are you sure i don't know clearly it is but when you see the uh, the red sea stuff you it's very clearly coating every surface of the coral. It is available to it. And if it has an active transport mechanism, I can now visually understand how it would be pulling in. Mm -hmm. And then I think about like a Ganyapora. And so one of the things that I think about with like you, I immediately thought of when you said it grows to a, a, a basketball size, but the skeletal growth is pretty slow, mm -hmm. is that's all protein based, where the other one's like uh, calcification, mm -hmm. you know? So the big tissue is from finding more proteins and fats. Interesting. Right? And amino acids are the building blocks of uh, proteins, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm. you know, if we're not just reliant on photosynthesis and the amino acids produced from that, but you're actually allowing them to get it from the food, which, which is what they do in the wild as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like on most of these corals anyway, they're getting some method of this. Can you grow it faster that way? I mean, it doesn't sound like you would be able to give a definitive answer, but well, I, well feeding in general, I think is is going to be effective with that. Um, I guess like my point was that you also want to inhibit the growth of everything else because <laughs> it's the everything else that's going to be the problem. You know, I saw there was a study that was done in Hawaii a long time ago on like a bunch of different coral foods. Reef roids was in there. Oh, okay. Uh, reef chili was in there, and a bunch of them. And oddly enough, most of them actually decreased growth. <laughs> did they? Reef roids and, and reef chili were the only ones that didn't, right? Oh. They actually increased the growth. Uh, That's weird. But they mentioned in that paper, also grew algae. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what a shock. It was like a University of Hawaii study. Okay. So, that, that's interesting because like we, we do like a, a scientific journal like series on, on this channel, um, on, on the Tidal Gardens channel. And uh, yeah, that, that'd be an interesting one to, to dig back up and, and take a look at. That was, a, it was like the effects of light, flow, and food on a variety of corals. Oh, cool. So like, yeah, yeah. Find it. if you ask me, I'll find it for you. Uh, all right. So biggest issue that people run into with uh, Ghani Bora? Um, preferably with a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Preferably with a solution. Um, I would say that like the, the, the biggest issue was, is probably just like finding like uh, a good healthy specimen. And because a lot of times we shop because it's something is pretty 
And I really think that especially with, with Ghanis, there's a big difference between stuff that's aquacultured and stuff that's not aquacultured. Uh, just just starting with a healthier, um, I guess more like domesticated coral, it's gonna be it's gonna lead you to like a lot more success. There, there's a few different types of Ghanis that we have here that do grow really, really, really well in captivity. And uh, when you compare that to some of the new arrivals that you know we have to we put through all of our quarantine process and stuff, it takes a long time for them to get going. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's you know, for for a facility like us, you know, we're, we're we're doing a lot more things than most hobbyists would, and so I can only imagine the level of patience required to get you know, like a relatively wild caught new Ganiapora to really get it going at at the hobbyist level. So uh, let me ask you this question: mm -hmm. Wild versus farmed? What tends to be more expensive or cheaper? I guess. Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question because the stuff that tends to come in wild is going to be larger. And I think that perhaps like what, what tends to happen right after that is it gets chopped down. Hmm. And that could further stress it. Hmm. And, and because uh, you, usually, I, I don't know too many places that would retail sell a wild something or the other of Ghani. But the other thing, guys, is that the size that's that's uh, that's coming in from the wild? It's smaller than you might think it is. So um, a large aquacultured frag might not be that that much smaller than uh, than, than a full imported colony. So uh, yeah, the the, the, the cost. Yeah. Ghanis is a tough one because it's a hot coral right now. And so you're going to be paying like the hot coral tax. So if you wanted to get just get your foot in the door, you could probably find Ghanis for about like $35. The top end of Ghaniapora, seven, eight hundred dollars thousand dollars So it, it, it's, it's tough to say just, just based on that because there is a massive hype factor. If you if you don't want to participate in that, don't worry. Wait a little while. It'll eventually not be a hot coral, and it'll be much more affordable. But right as of right now, whatever the date is, it's hot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the value happens. proposition it's going to be murky at best. You know, it's so funny because when, like when I started this, I remember being able to go to the fish store and find like you know torches and stuff for like thirty five bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like. Those I remember thirty something gone. dollars for that was like expensive in my mind. Yeah, and now it's like, oh, you want a torch? And house also, payment. Back then, I could also buy something. You know, for one hundred and fifty bucks, I could get something that had ten heads on it. Yeah, you know, I could get an adult. It's not adult, but like a larger yeah. specimen. Those don't even exist now. Yeah, well, I mean, in 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 many ways, like a lot of people say that they want colonies. The market really is frags. People really like frags. It's true. Uh, so it's interesting because the reason I asked that question actually is because, you know, budget like really matters, especially stocking up a tank, you mm -hmm. know? And like one of the things that like a lot of people don't think about is like when you're looking at it is like survivability. Right? Mm -hmm. And so like when I buy it, I want it to live. Right. And so I'm immediately thinking oh. farming and if I, if if I saw the aquacultured tag now, you know, on mm -hmm. the coral, which presumably, hopefully, the people that do this would do this, would tell you where it came from. But uh, it's valuable to me now, mm -hmm. you know, like because I now know the chances of this thing living are stronger. Yeah. Right? So, and I know that you you, uh, you like you like to buy fish from uh, Elliot, mm -hmm. and like I always have a saying, it's like you can't save money on dead animals. Yep. So it is important that like stuff survive and just giving yourself the, the best chance just at the time of purchase is a nice thing. You know, yeah. I, the Elliot thing is a great example, man. It's like, I feel like I'm buying from a breeder, mm -hmm. you know, like somebody really cares for these animals and selected the right one, making sure it's eating, it's healthy. And if it's not take care of it because like, Dude, I'm just not willing to kill seven copper bands to find one that lives. Yeah. Just not emotionally prepared for that journey. We we hate dealing with fish here. Like people yeah. always ask us, like, when are you gonna like start offering fish? I'm like, uh, probably never. It is just a process that it sucks. It brings every it bums everybody out. 
here. Well, you know the problem, really, in the, that end? I could go on for a while because it's something I actually care about. <laughs> this is about Connie's. <laughs> yeah, I could care about but like, is that there is nowhere where the cheapest source of pets is the best. Yeah. And for whatever reason with fish, we all are prioritizing the cheapest available option as the best, and it's just not possible. And there's yeah. no place in the entire world where the source of the cheapest pets is the best pets. You know? Yeah. And so, like, it's just hard to define, you know, because it all just looks like, you know, a coal tang. You mm -hmm. know, like, I don't know, man. Like, how would I know that that one's so much better? You know? Yeah. And you know what? We're in the business of bringing stuff in wholesale just for our facility, mm -hmm. for fish. No clue as to, as to um, like, the, the entire transport chain, getting it from wherever to here. And it's it, it that that to me is just lost. And and I have like friends that do import and stuff, and it's just yeah. Sometimes I wish it could be like worded better, you know, like uh, with your coral, like you know, it could say you know uh, aquaculture diet, like like almost like a better word is like guaranteed to survive in an artificial environment. That I want. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of like cutting to the chase a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, at, at some point, it's like, you know, it's part of the hobby. You have to kind of like try to take care of these things. And it's like, I can't guarantee that it's going to do well in your tank because your tank might suck. And, okay. But... Well, that, so that's the thing is like, when a, when a guarantee happens, man, in our hobby, for some reason, that means 100% never fails. There's no outliers. 99.9 .9 is not good enough. It has to be if you said a guarantee. But that's not really a guarantee. A guarantee is, uh, hey, this thing will live in an, in a, you know, a, a, a uh, like an artificial environment. And if it doesn't, man, I'll help you out. You know, figure it out, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think our official policy is like a seven day. Yeah, something like that. But it's really about like trying to like. Uh, uh, smooth out like irregularities and like shipping stress that sort oh, of yeah, thing because yeah, yeah. it's like because here's the thing like if you didn't buy that coral it's going to live another seven days in my system mm -hmm. like it's it's like something happened in, in the transactional process of shipping it or whatever something happened if you ever followed a box through uh, FedEx and UPS I don't want to yeah you'd be amazed <laughs> that uh, uh, it happens this yeah it's like it, I don't want to know how that hot dog is made yeah, they call them throwers for a reason. Ah, like that little this way up thing. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. I I just wish that, like, you know, Elliot, this is a little bit squirrely off of our topic, but I have yeah. to go down this hobby or down this track. I I just wish, like, he asked me all the time. He was like, hey, well, what, you know, should I call it quarantined or whatever? And I'm like, dude, whatever you could do, just, like, get rid of that word quarantine because that means I don't know what that means. You know, it means something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, to me, what you're selling is a parasite free fish. Mm -hmm. Like, like you're going to proactively treat it for all of these parasites. And so if they're on there, like, you know, you sold me a fish and it was, you know, a hundred bucks. And then there was one that's been quarantined, you know, for 130 bucks. Well, you know what? If there was another one, instead of saying quarantine, it said parasite free. I don't know what I'd pay for it, but it's a lot more than the first one, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so, like, how do you get the terminology so that we all know what we're expecting so we can up the game and, and more importantly, value whatever it is, you know? Yeah, that's tricky. Yeah. All right. Next one here is fragging. So, on Ganiapora, like, what's the best way to, you know, Chop it up and trade it, so, or even okay. grow it. This is a weird thing about Ghanis, and I and I, I I wish I had the receipts to show this. Like there there was a an actual scientific journal about it, I believe. But Ghanis are kind of different than other corals, in that uh, so we we chop everything through like you know like the diamond bladed bandsaw, like the griffins and whatever, right? Uh, and usually uh, people are like, oh, you know, you want to isolate an eye or something like that and, and it'll grow like a chalice or, or whatever, right? You want to isolate this individual polyp or whatever you want to do. Ganiopora is different in that you can take a core sample of it and it will regrow polyps hmm. from like the ends, like just a calcium carbonate cube of the inside of it that's a living thing will regrow. 
Hmm. We don't do it that aggressively, granted. Like we, when, when it comes to our fragging method, we're super conservative because we're not in a hurry. Like we're not trying to like flip corals. We're trying to grow corals forever. So we want to avoid the situation where we are killing stuff by cutting it too aggressively. So we're just like, you know what? Cut, wait, cut, wait. And, and finally, so when something is like sellable, we'll start selling. But you get one cut here, guys. One cut, you let it heal. One cut, you let it heal. But apparently, Ghanis are particularly good about getting cut because of that weird biology that they have that yeah they have no problem regrowing from you could like apparently remove all the outside flesh but the inside will regrow full regrow flesh and regrow polyps okay i'm having a flashback uh oh <laughs> yeah uh i'm going all the way back to imac like i don't know 2006 right i'm watching uh kelfo talk about uh fragging corals and he was talking about like a lot of ways that most people like don't know right so one of them was uh with uh like a, a torch is they grow those little nubbins underneath uh -huh. right and so that when you see them you can either and they usually die off because they get you know shaded if you turn the coral to the side all of a sudden the nubbins will grow and you'll have grow the coral faster but also that like back then he was saying people didn't particularly you know like you know propagate these things you can scoop that little nubbin out mm -hmm. uh, and then grow the little nubbin okay but this is where the flashback comes from because there's like all kinds of different ways to do this he, i can't remember what coral it was i want to say it was some kind of brain coral but nah, I'm, I'm, maybe somebody in my audience will remember this from 20 years ago if you were at the same thing i was at but slicing them like a little pancake so he would take mm -hmm. one like mounding coral and then turn it into like 30 or 40 little slices and then you flip it over sideways so it just got a little thin ribbon on the outside of it and then it has like this response to try to get back to a like a like a stable size or whatever and it'll grow back over the flat part interesting okay so now like when you're talking like i can't help but wonder if that combination of having a little bit of tissue on the edge and that the, the calcium carbonate structure itself actually seems to grow yeah could you got one and turn it into 30. and again guys I, I have to preface this this is not what we do title gardens yeah no no that was experimental Th this <laughs> is this is based on a a this is like years ago too a scientific journal that I'm barely recollecting, mm -hmm. but yes, uh, it, it could have that level of regenerative ability. That'd be interesting. Yeah, where we are like way too like conservative when it comes to cutting to even attempt that. But I know some wacky mad scientist of a hobbyist is out there is like about to, to give it a go. <laughs> go for it. Let, let us know. Let us know. You know, I wish sometimes that there was like a, like some cool little pocket where. Because I, sometimes I feel guilty, like when I bring up something like this, because I know somebody's going to go out and do this now, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but like, make sure you come back to this video and tell everybody how it went. Because yeah. this is now, if that's if this was the inspiration for this, if other people want to do it too, man, share the results. Yeah, and by the way, YouTube is a thing, you know, like record stuff, show people your work. <laughs> It helps. Well, so forever, I've actually wanted to take a whole bunch of different corals and dip them in different things and see the results. It just gets really time consuming and there's so many corals. I wish there was like a repository, you know, for like, all right, guys, as a community, here's our task. You mm -hmm. know, our task is we need to dip all these things in different corals. Who's going to sign up for what? And then collectively, you know, we can, you know, assemble all of this. We know the 20% outlier weird experiences, but 80% of the time it produces this result. Mm -hmm. I like, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, and or just the uh, the focus on recovering sick corals because there's there's um, there's like a pressure to always be perfect um, in in social media and whatever and however you want to. Um, to display like yourself in your tank and uh it, it's an uncomfortable task to then like talk about all like the the the, the scratch and dent type corals 
and the process it took to to try to save them. There was actually one website, and I I can't remember the lady's name. I'm so I'm sorry. The same person as you. She was a, a Magna speaker at Milwaukee, and she, her whole website was just dedicated to bringing corals back from like the brink. Dude, she had a. She's like an engineer. Yeah. And she applied engineering like thought process yeah. to. I think she's like a military engineer or something of the sort. It's the cool. Go watch the video. It's a Macna. I can't think of the lady's name either, but uh, it's it's on. She literally her hobby is to go to the the fish stores, find all the corals that are They're dying, like mostly dead, like yeah. hopeless causes, bring them back to life. And she's developed a methodology for it that is, you know, based on like the like, like an type. engineering flowchart. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's each very interesting. It's specific to each coral type is the like what a cool end of the hobby. Bring things back to life systematically. Yeah, because yeah. again, that is like one of the uh, the not so glamorous aspects of this hobby is like, yeah, sometimes things are not going to go well. How do you troubleshoot it? How do you deal with it? And then to have you know, like more people like chime in on, hey, by the way, this really worked well for me. That'd be nice. All right, we learned something about Ganyapora here. Uh, hopefully, we'll get another coral in here. We'll see uh, Than again and again because uh, this is one. You of are the most always fun. welcome to come hang out. Uh, you're, you're as welcome. Come to Minnesota. I'm, <laughs> I'm coming back too. This is a short flight for me. Really easy. Took me a great dinner. I'm totally in. Uh, so, all uh, right. Well, thank you for sharing all the information. Thanks, guys. Bye.